to our debate tonight. My name is Dr. Mark Foreman. I'm a professor of philosophy here at Liberty University, and I will be the moderator for tonight's debate. A number of things I want to go over. First of all, our topic for tonight is the topic, Does God Exist? Our participants in our debate are Max Andrews from Liberty University and Dan Lidford from Virginia Tech. This debate is sponsored by the Liberty University chapter of Ratio Christi, the Liberty University chapter of Phi Sigma Tau, the National Honor Society for Philosophers, and the Liberty University Philosophy Department. And we want to welcome you here tonight. One quick announcement, there are some teachers who are offering extra credit, those kinds of things, to students who are attending the debate here tonight. Um, if you're one of Dr. Baggett's students, he's sitting over here in the back, right over there, and we need you to see him after the debate, and he'll note that you're here. If you're one of my students who's here for my 240 class, uh, CB after the debate, we'll take care of that, okay? So there's a couple of things I need to go over before we get started here, and one of those things I want to talk a little bit about, if I can, is debate etiquette. For some people who may, maybe never been to an academic debate uh, on a campus or something like that, let me just talk a little bit about that, if I can, for you here, okay? The basic key factor behind the, the debate here is going to be respectfulness and civility. Okay, obviously we have two opposing viewpoints here, and I, I would assume that many of you have very passionate beliefs and feelings about those particular viewpoints here. That's understandable, that's why we're interested in what's going on in this debate tonight. But we want to make sure that we are respectful of both positions here, and give the participants in the debate the full respect that they deserve in coming here and doing that. Okay, so we ask you to do a couple things. First of all, hold all applause off until the end. I will give you an opportunity at the very end of the debate to give an applause to both of our, our uh, debaters here, but we ask please that you not, do not applause during the debate or anywhere in the middle of the debate time or while we're transitioning from different person to different person here. We'll do that at the end, okay? Also, it's really inappropriate, folks, for you to cheer or to boo or to yell out comments or anything like that uh, during the debate here. Uh, if somebody says something you agree with or disagree with or something like that, that's really considered inappropriate. This is not a sporting event. Okay, that's not the idea of what's going on here. This is an academic debate where two people who are who have become experts in their field and discussing these things are basically talking about arguments here. Okay, so we don't we're not going to cheer them on or something along those lines. That would be considered inappropriate to do. Also, if you do have to get up and leave during the debate, emergency situation, or you have to use the bathroom, something areas like that, we do ask you to wait for an appropriate transition. When one of the debaters has finished speaking and goes to sit down, and if you want to quickly leave the room at that time, that's fine. But during the debate, while they're up there speaking, please do not move around the room, uh, get up and leave, or something like that, because it is distracting the debaters, and we don't want to do that. You know, as much as you can see them, they can also see you. Keep that in mind. Okay. Um, Basically, folks, what we want you to do here as you listen to this tonight is we want you to open your minds and to learn. That's the basic idea here. Both of these, these debaters are going to present arguments to you, ideas to you, and you should listen to them and try to learn from them as best as, best, best as you can. You know, especially I want to recommend you do that to the person who's maybe the opposing view of yours. Okay? They have something to say and we can learn from that person. Okay, so we need to sit here, listen, learn, not immediately want to kind of set up our barriers, try to be defensive about what's going on here. Listen to what they have to say and learn from them, and you'll, I think, get a great amount from that, okay? Especially I want to make a comment to our LU students, which I assume is the vast majority of the people that are here. We have a number of guests here on campus, certainly Dan is one of our guests here, uh, but we have some other guests that have come to campus, and I want you to treat them with the respect and the courtesy that they deserve as guests. Uh, when they come here, okay? Please, please uh, do that. Welcome them here. Let them know that they're welcome to be here, and we're excited about having them here to speak to us tonight or be with us, okay? I want you to turn off your cell phones if you can do that, okay? Turn at least silence them so that we can't hear them. However, we do have a live Twitter uh, event going on here at the same time. If you want to use your Twitter account, you can do that. Just so you know, the whatever you Twitter, and I'm going to give you the hashtag here in a moment for that, okay? That will be recorded. That will be recorded and the debaters will be able to go back later and actually look at your comments. So if you have comments during the debate, you want to make it a Twitter situation, as long as you do it quietly and unobtrusively and respectfully to the people around you as well as the debaters, you can tweet to L-U-G-O-D-E-A-B-A-T-E, that's L-U-G-O-D-E-A-B-A-T-E, -E, that's one word, L-U-G-O-D-E-A-T-E, hashtag L-U-G-O-D-E-A-T-E on your Twitter account and you can make comments in that area. I especially want to thank Dan for driving uh, all the way here from Blackbird and entering into this somewhat maybe hostile territory <laughs> for his new year. Um, I know I speak from those in our department, 
from Five Seconds of Hell and Ratio Christie that we very much respect him. We appreciate uh, him coming here, and we look forward to a lively debate. So thank you, Dan, for, for coming here all the way to Glasgow. We do appreciate it. <laughs> format of tonight's debate so you know what's going on. The debate's going to open with two presentations. Max will start as the affirmative position to the question of God's existence. He'll take 17 minutes to open with his presentation, followed by Dan giving 17 minutes of his presentation, taking the negative position on the question. That, then we will have Max again offer our seven-minute rebuttal, and Dan will come up and offer a seven-minute rebuttal. Okay, this will be followed by 10 minutes of cross-examination where Max gets to ask Dan specific questions where they'll actually talk to each other rather than just talking to you and presenting, uh, presenting arguments here. Uh, and then that'll be followed by 10 minutes where Dan will be able to do the same to Max and ask Max questions here. After the cross-examination period, they will both have five minutes each to offer their closing statement. And after that, we'll have a time of questions and answers. Now let me talk a little bit about the question and answer period so you're aware of that, okay? Each of you was handed, hopefully handed, a three by five card when you came in. If you did not get one, you know, if you'll stick your hand up, hopefully people can get around and get one to you, okay, some way or another. Uh, I want you guys to do that. Okay, I have some three by five cards on the table or whatever. We may have run out, so. But uh, at any rate, you were handed a three by five card uh, at, at, when you first came in. This is for the question and answer period. As the debate is raging on up here in the front, if a question occurs to you, write it on the card. Your question should be addressed to either Max or Dan, so please make sure you address it to one of the two debaters, okay? And uh, we ask you to keep your question brief, to stay on topic, and to please write legibly so we can read it, okay? Uh, at the end of the debate, we will collect the cards. Because of our time element, obviously we're not gonna be able to address everyone's question, especially if everyone here asked them. That's over 500 people asking the questions. That would be a bit much, okay? Uh, Dr. Martin and Dr. Beck will sift through the questions and select those that we believe are pertinent and significant to our topic here, and they will hand the card to me, and I will read the question to the participant to whom it is addressed. We ask our participants here to keep their answer brief, and on topic and not to use it as an opportunity to offer us a whole nother presentation, okay? The other participant will then be given an opportunity to briefly respond to the question as well. We will then move on to the next question and continue until our time is up at this particular point. I will introduce each participant before their opening presentation and I will start with Max here. Max Andrews completed his BS in religion, specializing in biblical studies here at Liberty University. He is finishing his MA in philosophical studies and is the graduate assistant for, uh, for philosophy professor Dr. David Beck. His primary research is on the fine-tuning argument for the existence of God as it relates to multiverse scenarios. Max has two papers in the Cornell University History of Phil and Philosophy of Physics um, a preprint archive on Albert Einstein and scientific theology, as well as the relationship between scientific realism and epistemology. He has also written a review in the Midwestern Journal of Theology on Molinism, which concerns the relationship between divine ambitions, human freedom, and providence. This past November, he co-authored a paper on God and the multiverse with Dr. Beck, which was presented at the Evangelical Philosophical Society's annual conference in Milwaukee. The same paper is now under consideration to be included in a book published by Routledge on Theism and the Multiverse, edited by Klaus Craig. Additionally, Max has studied at the Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture in Science and Culture in Seattle, Washington in 2010. Max is a member of Phi Sigma Tau, the National Honor Society for Philosophy, and is currently an officer for the Philosophy Club at Ratio Christi. This summer, Max and his wife Leo will be moving to Scotland to begin his PhD in philosophy at the University of Edinburgh under Alistair Richmond. His dissertation will be on the fine-tuning of gnomic behavior in multiverse scenarios and the ontology of the many worlds interpretation of quantum physics. Sounds like a fun reading. Okay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Max Andrews. It's a pleasure to be able to participate in tonight's debate. I thank all of you for attending. This evening I will be defending the proposition God exists. And to, uh, and to defend my case, I will present four arguments that provide good, positive reasons for believing that God exists. 
It will be a conjunction of these arguments that will construct a strong, evidential, and cum cumulative case for the existence of God. The first argument is the cosmological argument. Premise one, there are contingent constituents to the universe. Two, given the contingent constituents of the universe, the existence of the universe is very, very unlikely under the hypothesis that these constituents themselves are uncaused or self-caused. Three, given the contingent constituents of the universe, the existence of the universe is not unlikely under the hypothesis of a first uncaused cause. Therefore, the existence of the universe strongly supports the hypothesis of a first uncaused cause over the hypothesis of a non-first uncaused cause. The constituents of the universe include galaxies, planets, stars, cars, humans, leptons, bosons, and other particles. For the constituents of the universe to be uncaused, that would mean that they would be metaphysically necessary. For something to be metaphysically necessary, that means it could not have failed to exist. It exists in every possible world. For something to be self-caused, it must simultaneously be antecedent to itself to produce its own effect. But this is contradictory. This would be akin to the ultimate bootstrapping trick. Our last option is for the universe to be contingent. Something is contingent if and only if it is not necessarily false and not necessarily true. In other words, it might or might not have existed. We observe that some things in the universe are contingent. That is, it owes its existence to something else. What we observe in the universe consists of a network of cause and effects. This network of cause of causes have an infinite regress of other contingent causes, be self-caused, or have a first non-contingent cause. However, a network of contingent causes cannot go on to infinity. In such a series, the intermediate causes have no power of their own, but are mere effects of the preceding causes. For instance, think of a train. Boxcar A is pulled by B, but only because B is pulled by C, and so on. Even if the boxcars number to infinity, the boxcars don't move unless there is a locomotive causing them to move. Also, consider David Hume's objection to this, stating that you can never get an infinite cause from a finite effect. Hume argued that if you can explain the subsets, or the boxcars, then you can explain the whole infinite set. Paul Edwards follows Hume on similar lines. Edwards argues that each one in the series fully explains the one uh, that depends on it. Every, not, every member is genuinely the cause of the one that follows it. However, in explaining the first member of a set, one must go outside of the set in order to explain it. An infinite series never gets out of the set. One must focus on a series one must focus on a series in which a member's existence is explained by the preceding cause. Because the universe is a network of contingent causes, and therefore not uncaused or self-caused, there must be a first cause in the network of, of contingent causes. The reason that any contingent thing exists at all, and in particular our world of which we are a part, is that a contingent causal consequence of a metaphysically necessary, non-contingent being, a being which itself could not have failed to exist. By implication, we remain with an uncaused cause, which must be spaceless, timeless, and transcendent. Thus, to ask the question, what caused the first uncaused cause, is nonsensical. The second argument, is the fine-tuning argument. This argument argues that when physics and the laws of nature are expressed mathematically, their values are ever so balanced in a way that permits the existence of life. I'm merely arguing that the universe is finely tuned for the essential building blocks 
and environments that life requires. Premise one. Given the fine-tuning evidence, a life-permitting universe is very, very unlikely under the non-existence of a fine-tuner. Premise 2. Given the fine-tuning evidence, a life-permitting universe is not unlikely under the hypothesis of a fine-tuner. Therefore, a life-permitting universe strongly supports the hypothesis that there is a fine-tuner over the hypothesis that there is not a fine-tuner. So, what are some of the evidences for fine-tuning? Sir Roger Penrose calculates that the odds of the special low entropy condition having come about by chance in the absence of any constraining uh, principles is at least as small as about 1 in 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 123. The strong nuclear force coupling constant, if that were increased, we would only have, we would have no hydrogen, which is an essential building block for life. And if it were decreased, we would only have hydrogen. The mass of a proton, which is 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms, if this were any different, then atomic nuclei could not form properly. The gravitational attraction constant, where G equals 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newton meters squared over kilogram squared. Changing this would result in the loss of star and planetary formation, which are necessary conditions for life. If we increase it, stars burn too hot and they burn out too quickly. If it were any weaker, the stars would never burn heavy elements which are needed for complex chemistry. The list is quite extensive. The 20 fundamental constants alone requires values that are ever so balanced on a razor's edge. What's more is that the fundamental constants stand independent of each other, but function together to allow for an anthropically friendly universe. The question is whether it is more reasonable to infer the existence of a fine tuner to produce a product that exhibits fine tuning or whether this happened by random chance or necessity. The random chance hypothesis is so unfathomably improbable, it would be unreasonable to suggest that this is the best explanation. Or some may argue that the laws and the behaviors of physics must behave this way because it's metaphysically necessary that they do so. But from a naturalist or platonic perspective, there doesn't seem to be any account for why this is metaphysically necessary, since counterfactual depictions of these values are certainly feasible and coherent. The conclusion follows logically from the premises. This gets us to an extremely intelligent mind. The amount of information, the balance of this information, uh, the balance of the information content expressed in physics and the mathematical language of physics required an explanation. And the best explanation, based on our experience, is that a mind was causally antecedent to the information we observe. Thus, the evidence of the fine-tuning we observe, the values of constants and the laws of nature, is much, much more likely under the hypothesis that there is a fine tuner. The third argument is the moral argument. Premise one, there are objective axiological geontic facts that obtain. Two, either the world alone or the world and a perfectly moral person best explain these facts. Premise three, it is the case that the world and a perfectly moral person best explain these facts. And our conclusion, therefore, theism is the likely explanation for these facts based on the inference from the conjunction of the world and a perfectly moral person. In essence, it seems that there are objective moral facts, and this asks the question, what's the best explanation for objective morality? Premise one assumes moral realism. Some actions really are objectively, morally abhorrent. By objective, I mean that the truth value of such facts stand independent of whether or not anyone recognizes them to be true. 
For instance, raping and torturing children for pleasure is wrong. Teenage girls being trafficked around the world for sex is abominable. One ought to love others. One ought not to rape and murder. Now, what is the best explanation for these facts? Well, there are two options for the best explanation. The first is the natural world alone. The world can account for certain moral facts, but natural explanations will ultimately be insufficient in explanatory scope and power. It does seem to be the case that the natural order can account for some things due to certain features of this world, such as the intersubjective moral agreements, satisfactions of morality. We feel good when we do good. Creatures with cognitive, cognitive, and affective capacities as ours. Rational apprehension of moral truths. Creatures with essential properties we have. The world is metaphysically rich and robust. All of these things are just what the theist would expect in a good theology of nature. Attempts to ground such axiological facts and socio-biological evolution will ultimately be inefficient. For an axiological fact to be objective, it must be true in all possible worlds. The fact must be necessary. If we were to rewind the film of evolution and allow it to play again, it's certainly possible that natural selection acting on random mutations would bring about a completely different biological landscape from what we observe today. Additionally, purely naturalistic theories suffer the is-ought problem. Where do obligations come from? Deontology, or duty-based ethics, uh, deontology, or duty-based eth ethics, cannot be accounted for in purely naturalistic axiology. If ought implies can, and one is naturally determined to act contrary to the ought, how proficient can such a view be in accounting for these facts. The other option is the world in conjunction with a morally perfect person. This world conjoined with a morally perfect person provides a much more, uh, a more robust case and provides a better explanation of the full range of moral facts in need of explanation. Such an explanation describes a world that has the texture, depth, and thickness it does, and is able to exist in the first place because it was imbued with value and meaning by this perfectly moral person. It must be a person because a person, a mind, is the only thing that can issue imperatives or issue commands. A combination of persons or a social theory doesn't work because persons are equal in imperative actions. Thus, there must be a person that has the authority to issue such obligatory imperatives and ground these moral facts. My last argument is the ontological argument, which argues for the existence of an essential, omniscient, omnipotent, morally perfect being. Premise one. The property of being maximally great is exemplified in some possible world. Two, the property of being maximally great is equivalent, by definition, to the property of being maximally excellent in every possible world. Three, the property of being maximally excellent entails the properties of omniscience, omnipotence, and moral perfection. Four, a universal property is one that is exemplified in every possible world or not. Five, any property that is equivalent to some property that holds in every possible world is a universal property. Our conclusion, therefore, there exists a being that is essentially omniscient, omnipotent, and morally perfect. Now, this is a very technical argument. So let's try to make some sense of this. When I refer to a possible world, I'm merely referring to a logically possible state of affairs. I'm not referring to other universes or other planets. A possible world is a dis maximal description of any logically possible state of affairs. 
The first premise simply states that the property of being maximally great is logically possible. That is, no contradiction obtained. Premise two draws on the logical equivalence of maximal greatness with maximal excellence. Premise three follows from the logical equivalence found in premise two. And premise four presents a disjunction. Either universal property X obtains in all worlds, hence its universality, or it is necessarily a contradiction and is impossible to obtain. The fifth premise affirms the first disjunct presented, which is simply that if a property obtains in every possible world, then it is a universal property. Thus, if a universal property obtains in some possible world, then this universal property obtains in all possible worlds. Therefore, if such universal properties obtain in all possible worlds, then they obtain in the actual world. This argument just doesn't define God into existence either. Rather, it's an a priori argument that merely suggests that God is possible. So, from where does God's necessity come? If it comes from another, then it lacks a particular great-making property and thus contingent. However, if God's necessity comes from himself, that such great-making property refers to God's essence. Additionally, if God is simple, then God is his essence, and his essence is to exist. Premise one is the only controversial premise since remaining premises and conclusion follow logically. So what atheism must affirm is that the concept of God is logically incoherent. I have to give them time to switch off laptops up here while we're doing that. Let me introduce uh, Dan. Dan Lan Linford is a graduate student in philosophy at Virginia Tech and is originally from Rochester, New York. He, had, he was a PhD student in physics and was working on non-equilibrium statistical physics before joining the philosophy department. Dan is also currently working on earning the graduate certificate in religious studies from Virginia Tech. Dan earned his undergraduate degree in physics at the University of Rochester, where he graduated with honors and was president of the Physics Honor Society Sigma Pi Sigma. Dan is a contributing author for SkepticFreeThought.com and a regional speaker for the Secular Student Alliance. He serves on the executive board of the Free Thinkers at Virginia Tech, which is associated with both the Secular Student Alliance and the Center for Inquiry. In the past, Dan has done research on and given talks about nanotechnology at an NINN conference in Santa Barbara and on non-equilibrium physics at four different conferences on a mathematical model of the spread of religious beliefs and on the relationship between science and religion. Anyone who would like more information can visit his blog at www.skepticfreethought.com slash libere, L-I-B-E-R-E. Dan, welcome to Liberty University. Let's give him a hand. I'd like to extend a gracious uh, thank you for, sorry, I would like to, like, like to extend a thank you to Max Andrews for his gracious invitation. Um, I'd like to thank Martin Foreman uh, and Ratio Christie, uh, the Liberty University Philosophy Department. Um, and I'd like to thank all of you for coming out tonight. All right, so, uh, well, first, there's a few things that we all agree upon. We all agree that nature exists. And if we have no reason to think that there is anything beyond nature, well, then we should just be committed to the things that we actually know exist, which is nature. Um, and I don't deny that there could be something beyond nature, but the question is, how could we know what would be beyond nature, and how could we know what that thing is if it exists? And importantly, uh, can Max provide us with some reasons to think that God exists? So, does God exist? Uh, that is the question on the table this evening. Um, well, first, I'm going to tell you about a certain kind of methodology that one might use to address that question. And then I'll tell you why I think that Max's way, of, Max's way of answering that question doesn't particularly work. And then I'm going to tell you some reasons to think that God does not exist, starting off with something that I call the argument from problematic properties. 
Uh, second, I'm going to tell you about something I call the argument from uneven resources. Uh, and then I'll tell you about some additional arguments if there's time. Uh, well, Max brought up this issue of morality, which seems to come up every single time there's a, a debate of this kind. Uh, but I'm not exactly sure why, because for the, mass, the vast majority of the history of what's called meta-ethics, people have been producing meta-ethical views without having to posit a god in their system. From Aristotle, Plato, to Kant, and Hume, and up to modern thinkers like John Rawls. So we're not here tonight to debate which meta-ethical view is the right one. We're here tonight to debate the existence of God. And so I'll leave the meta-ethics debate to other people. What would be the right kind of method for evaluating questions of this kind? What we want is a method that is both reliable and consistent, which is to say that it reliably and consistently gives us the truth, basically, that gives us true answers to the questions that we ask. Uh, and we want to rely on evidence to do so. Max seems to agree, he says on his blog, that one ought to base one's beliefs corresponding to the evidence. He says, I believe there are good theological reasons to believe according to the evidence. Well, unfortunately, faith is not the sort of thing which is both reliable and consistent, because people have faith in all different kinds of things all across the planet. Uh, so we can't rely on faith to answer the question as to whether God, God exists. I'm going to tell you about two general rules for evaluating questions of this kind. First, we favor hypothesis if the evidence is what we would expect to have if the hypothesis were true, and we have evidence against the hypothesis if the evidence is contrary to what we would think what we would see if the evidence were sorry, if the hypothesis were true. So for example, if I told you that there was an elephant in this room, you'd tell me no there isn't, because well this room doesn't look like what it would look like if there was an elephant in here. And if I told you that there was a dragon in my garage, the first thing that you do is you demand to see the dragon. And if I brought you to the garage and we saw an empty garage, you'd say, well damn, I thought there was gonna be a dragon here. And so I tell you, oh well you see is an invisible dragon. And I say, oh, well, let's no bother. We'll just get out you know, our trusty infrared equipment, and we'll see the heat that's produced by the dragon, right? Because it produces flames. And then you say, oh, but Dan, it's an invisible, heatless dragon. And so on it goes. Uh, what's going on here is a species of ad hoc reasoning where we try to save a hypothesis when it's not really worth saving. So Max wants to posit God as an explanation of a series of phenomena, the existence of the universe, the fine-tuning of the universe, the existence of objective moral standards, um, and he has his oxological argument in there as well. So we want to know, does God actually work as an explanation? Well, it turns out that positive God actually creates more mysteries than it solves. So we have the following sorts of questions. Is God the sort of being likely to create the kind of universe we live in? If not, then we actually have evidence against the existence of God. Why should we think that the mysterious phenomenon in question is due to a single being as opposed to multiple beings or mechanisms? If we don't have an answer to that, we have evidence against God. Why should we think that all these phenomena are created by the same thing at the same time as opposed to creation of multiple things at multiple times? If we can't answer that, then we have evidence against God. How do we know that the fine tuning wasn't due to some physical mechanism that is not yet understood? If we can't answer that question, then again, we have evidence against God. And if theism really is explanatory, why hasn't it given rise to any successful scientific research programs? If we don't know the answer to that, then we have evidence against God. And how can we posit a disembodied mind when every other mind we've ever observed is embodied in the brain? If we can't answer that question, then again, we have evidence against God. And again, Max needs to answer these questions in a non-ad hoc way. So the first argument has to do with the properties of God, uh, the problematic in a sort of a deep way. So first consider the proposition, there is a non-spatial mountain. And this proposition is problematic because there are properties of being a mountain which assume the object takes up space. Similarly, if you consider the proposition, there is a being who has a will and causes events but exists outside of time, that's problematic because having a will and causing events seems to assume that the being is in time. So there are a whole host of metaphysical issues 
which make it dubious as to whether it ever makes sense of what it would be for God to exist. And now we have the argument from uneven resources. So the world was created with an uneven distribution of resources with no clear indication of what a given region has in its favor. Humans are created as a kind of animals which have a propensity to not share, to conquer others and to hate the other, that is to hate people that are different from themselves. So both of those things are true, and the world is set up in such a way so as to produce massive amounts of suffering, war, strife, starvation, etc. It's for some cultures to do systematically better than others. A loving, all-knowing, all-powerful God is not likely to create a world of that kind. Therefore, we have evidence that a being of that kind, in fact, does not exist. So Jared Diamond, in his book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, addresses the way in which the geography of various different regions on the planet affects the cultures that were eventually given rise there. He says, compared to the hunter-gatherers, citizens of modern industrialized states enjoy better health care, lower risk of death by homicide, and a longer lifespan. In most locations on Earth do not allow for agricultural societies to start, so they can't even get out of the stage of being a hunter-gatherer. Geographic differences in the local sweep of wild plants and animals available for domestication go a long way toward explaining why only a few areas become independent centers of food production, that is why they become agricultural societies, and why it arose earlier in some of those areas than in others. A major contributing factor to those, so if you look at the rate of spread of agriculture across the planet, a major contributing factor to that rate of to dip those different rates of spread turns out to have been the orientation of the continent's axes. So in fact, the continents were built in such a way, if they were built, to not allow for agriculture to spread in some places, but for it to spread in others. Now there are two possible responses uh, that I could imagine someone having to an argument of this kind. Uh, the first is what's called the free will response. Uh, so the world is not designed to have suffering in it. Someone might say, but people do terrible things to each other because they have free will, and that's what creates suffering. But notice that the distribution of resources on the planet is not due to the free will of people. So this sort of response fails. What about the wrath of God? Uh, perhaps God is punishing certain groups of people for some reason. But why should different cultures be punished on the basis of where they sort of arbitrarily happen to have migrated? It doesn't seem that a benevolent God would be racist. Remember the rules of the game. If Max provides, if Max provides an ad hoc response, those cannot possibly count in his favor. In fact, there's some sense in which they would count against him. So maybe Max can show that there is no contradiction between being in a universe like ours and God existing. Maybe he can show that these are logical, compatible ideas. But that's irrelevant if he provides that kind of response because what we want to know is whether or not we can infer from the way that our universe appears that God exists. So on his blog, Max states this philosopher really wrote, who also provides some more arguments, um, makes a strong case for why atheism is true. Rowe supposes that, as especially in the absence of other arguments, anyone who observes the amount of human and animal suffering in the world and thinks that those things are pointless, and this person be rationally justified in believing that atheism is the case. So Max thinks that the problem, he addresses, addresses the problem that he thinks appears in Rowe's argument, is that it turns humans into divine pets, he calls them. Uh, that God would have to actively prevent the suffering in the world. But that argument doesn't my argument doesn't suffer from that objection because I'm addressing the way that the world is in fact constructed or put together. Both theists and atheists agree that the argument from evil, which my argument is a species of what's more generally called the argument of evil, is the best argument against the existence of God, or so it says in studies of surveys of philosophers of religion. And my argument meets the standards for evidence that we laid out at the beginning. How much time do I have? Uh, about, you have about six minutes. Okay. Uh, well, uh, so you might notice that scientists do not presently postulate God when doing scientific work. But there are two possible reasons why this might be. So there might be some intrinsic fact about the nature of science that's for some reason it disallows you from being able to cite God when you're doing science. 
Uh, that's called intrinsic methodological naturalism. Or you might think that scientists have provisionally stopped using God as an explanation in science because it didn't work as an explanation in the past. Well, that's something called provisional methodological naturalism. So in fact, scientists actually used to posit God in their scientific work, and they did this up through the 19th century. However, none of the hypotheses that were attempted in that way were actually successful. Uh, so for this reason, scientists stopped using religion to formulate hypotheses because provisionally it simply didn't work. But there's nothing intrinsic about science which would prevent us from inferring the existence of a being provided the one, of such a being provided the one existed. Thus, God's existence is a bad scientific explanation, not because science can't deal with the concept, rather it's because the God hypothesis has already been ruled out. You wouldn't have expected that to be the case if God actually existed, and therefore this is in fact evidence that God does not exist. So, our conclusion. So when we respond, watch to see if Max responds with an ad hoc reply. Watch to see if he actually answers the questions that posed back at the beginning. And then I had my various arguments. So God apparently is a bad explanation for the various mysterious features of our world. The world we live in doesn't seem to be the kind of world that a loving God would create. And the idea of God seems to be metaphysically problematic. In fact, scientists do not cite God when doing science. So the conclusion is God probably does not exist. What, what launch time do I have? Four minutes. I'll take those four minutes to address uh, some of Max's arguments. Um, well, first, about the cosmological arguments, he objected to the idea of something that was self-caused, uh, but by saying that it would involve something that would exist prior to itself. Well, really, self-cause is a misnomer. We're really mean something that comes into existence without a cause. Um, infinities aren't really problematic with doing science. Um, the way that you mathematically describe this room is that there's an infinity of points between you and me, and yet when I make a sound, the sounds that I make actually are able to get to you. Uh, that wouldn't be possible unless you're able to transverse through, for example, an infinite number of things. Um, let's see. And uh, as far as the ontological arguments, well, all of that argument depends on what are called great making properties. And in the literature, no one can actually agree on what those great making properties would be, whether they exist. Um, or why the four omnis, things like omniscience, omnibenevolence, and so on, why those might be maximally excellent, no one agrees with that. And in fact, Alton Plantinga, who originated the argument that Max gave, in fact, he doesn't think that the argument that Max gave was sound. And in his book, where he originally presents that argument, he states so. So that's... Please make sure your cell phones are off, or if you want to tweet, that's fine, but make sure they're silent. Okay, there are a couple phones I heard going off, at least one. And again, if you have to leave, this is a time that's appropriate to leave, or, or, or whatever, if you want to do that. Please don't do it while the you know, presenters are up here. And again, please hold all of all applause until we get to the end. We now have a time of rebuttal. Each of the participants will be given seven minutes uh, to offer rebuttal to their opponent, and we'll start with that. work with it. All right, so Dan's arguments uh, uh, touching with issues of faith, of uh, is God likely to create a universe? Uh, the argument based on this is not the type of universe that we would expect God to create, I would actually argue contrary to that. 
Um, but to make such a judgment that this is uh, most likely the universe that God would not create, in order to make some type of probability calculus, you've got to have some prior probability calculation in order to compare that to some type of posterior probability in order to make that calculation. But if God has all such great making properties, and we'll get to that in a little bit as far as great making properties are concerned, then a world full of, uh, that is full of uh, good, it's full of evil. Evil actually inversely is an indirect proof for the existence of God. In order to say that something is evil, we have to have objective grounding for that which is good. And so it's, it's almost uh, akin to uh, our teleological argument, the design, for example, if I use the example of designing a car, a car is still designed, but if it gets a flat tire or a dent in the car, that may be something that's not optimal, but it's still designed. But evil still serves as an indirect proof by being able to say something is evil objectively serves as proof for the existence of God. Um, as far as my methodology, uh, as far as confirmation theory, the relevance criterion of confirmation, uh, the theory states as follows. Let um, one hypothesis and hypothesis two be two competing hypotheses. And whenever I find such an evidence, if I find an evidence, such as in the fine-tuning case, the gravitational constant, if that evidence serves strongly in favor of the first hypothesis that there is a fine-tuner versus a non-fine-tuner, it's a non-ad hoc approach. So my methodology here of how I'm going about asking these questions uh, it's, a, it's a methodology called abduction. You look at the pool of data and you determine the relevance, uh, the relevance criterion for how you should balance it towards competing hypotheses. We do this in historical sciences all the time. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, God not being a proper, uh, with research programs, uh, historically, I guess, this doesn't serve as any evidence against God, nor does the use or posit of God in any research programs. This is just a really a sociological issue of what research programs use God or don't use God or appeal to God. Um, in fact, historically, God has produced a lot of our sciences. Modern science birthed it was birthed out of a field of uh, theologians, so to speak. And when talking about the issue of positing God as a scientific entity, I'm not positing God as a scientific entity, and I don't think that's an appropriate approach to science. We can have some metaphysical import to our science, but when I'm using God as an explanation for the fine-tuning of the universe, I'm not treating God in the way, same way that I treat a quark or a particle. It's a metaphysical inference made uh, via the abduction. It's a metaphysical and philosophical claim. So God cannot be involved in science as a scientific entity because it is a metaphysical issue. It's a philosophical issue. Um, as far as uh, in the issue of uh, having a disembodied mind as a, an appropriate uh, option or hypothesis. Well, that's just a category, that's a category mistake here. If we are positing minds, for instance, uh, brand new information from experience, brand new information comes from a mind. Natural causes can change information or distort information. But by our experience, look at computer sciences, brand new information has to come from a mind. Yes, it is embodied, and whether or not it's disembodied makes no difference as the, to the function and the role of the mind. 
So that's just a categorical difference that I, I don't think warrants any, uh, any fallacy to be accused of here or for it to discount against it. Um, as far as the, the problems with evil, I'd like for that to come out further in our cross-examination since um, it, was, it was really hard for me to, there, I didn't see much organization there for me to really systematically go through this, so during cross-examination we can go through this. As far as the geographic centers and uh, social economic positions for where God uh, placed peoples at certain points in time to accomplish his, his purposes. That again related to the problem of evil. We can address that uh, in more detail then. Um, let's see. Also, the quick responses that he, he brought up with the uh, role of infinites. Uh, the issue with infinity uh, on the cosmological argument. The issue of infinity not, there has to be a first cause for any series of causes or contingent causes. So even if you have an infinite train set, you can wrap around the caboose to the front and it still doesn't move. So there has to be a first cause for that. reasons why God might have placed people at various locations, various different points in time. It's not really relevant that you can give a story like that, because as I said, it doesn't matter whether or not we can make these two ideas logically compatible. It matters whether or not we can infer that the world as we see it is the kind of thing that we would be likely to think if God existed. Um, that actually is the nature of abductive inference. So if Max wants to use abduction, then he should notice that I'm doing the same thing. Abduction means an inference to the best explanation, which is what I've been talking about from the beginning. Uh, so just as an example of this kind of way in which people have been all over the place and been situated in different locations, um, we anthropologists now know that food production led to sedentary lifestyles. That is, it led agriculture led to people being situated in a constant location as opposed to being nomadic which in turn led to high population densities. Those high population densities developed, allowed people to develop immunities to diseases that they acquired from their domesticated animals. And upon meeting from people from other cultures, so for instance, when the Europeans met the people living in the Americas, uh, many of whom were either hunter-gatherers or who had sedentary lifestyles but didn't have them for very long, uh, those people so they can contact with weren't able to acquire those immunities, which means that 99% of them died from diseases, whereas the Europeans didn't usually contract diseases from the Native Americans. What does that tell us? It tells us that it was the geography itself that produced a situation where 99% of the people that used to occupy the continent that we are living on died, simply due to the accident where they happened to be living. Uh, so, Max brings up this issue of prior probabilities, but I would point out that, in fact, he can't calculate those, uh, those prior probabilities for his arguments either, um, so I'm not really sure why that's relevant. I didn't actually bring up any probabilities. I know that's prevalent in the literature right now, but I avoided it because I don't think that people can actually calculate such things. Um, so why, why would a suboptimal universe, Max says the universe might be suboptimal, why would God, who, as far as I can tell, as he's postulated, would be kind of an optimal being, uh, why would that God create a universe that ends up being suboptimal? Uh, I mean, I think that's the whole point of the argument, in a sense. Um, he claims that scientific research, uh, the fact that it doesn't cite God is more of a sociological issue, um, the fact that it's not postulated in our theories has something to do with the uh, has to do with the nature of science, but I don't really see why it is that there should be some kind of special metaphysical method. Um, if God exists, I don't see why we couldn't infer that somebody do anything else. 
Or if we can infer it through some kind of special metaphysical method, Max certainly hasn't told what that method is, abduction or inference, the best explanation, um, fitting an uh, explanation to data, is something that is done in science. It was originally developed by Charles Peirce as a way to explain what it is that scientists do. Um, Max says that brand new information comes only through minds. Uh, well, fine, but I don't know what that what relevance that has. The point was that God that existed would be a disembodied mind, but that's something very different from the kinds of minds that we see. Um, and he claims that a set of causes needs to have a start. I simply just don't see a reason why one would claim that. It seems to just be an assertion. Am I doing a time? Uh, two minutes and 45 seconds. All right, let's see what else we'll do. Um, well, uh, I didn't hear anything that addressed several of the questions that I brought up in my opening statements. Um, apparently, Max agrees that uh, the morality is irrelevant to this debate because he didn't give me a reason to think that that's not, that's not the case. Uh, so we just throw that issue out, I guess. Um, let's see here. Uh, right, so we didn't address the fact that the discussion, why should we think that all of these phenomena were created by the same thing at the same time as opposed to creation of multiple things and at multiple times? On his blog, he actually claims that the reason why we can do that is because of Occam's razor, that because of the four arguments I guess that he put together tonight, uh, the kind of being that you infer at the end, he thinks that all those arguments allow us to infer one being, but in fact that actually takes an additional argument, um, and it also takes telling me why it is that these properties aren't metaphysically problematic, or why it's the case that such a being wouldn't just simply complexify our ontology in some really gross ways. Um, yeah, so I think that's, I think that fully addresses everything he said, so. This will give an opportunity for the, the two proponents here, uh, participants, to actually talk with each other rather than just simply do presentations for you. So 10 minutes is allotted for this for each participant. We're going to start with Max, who's going to take 10 minutes and ask questions of Dan, um, and uh, they'll discuss the questions that Max raises. And then after that period of time, we give 10 minutes to Dan to basically ask questions of Max here. So Max will go first. We're going to take a second here to move this podium so they can, they can see each other. Because you didn't address it. What did I not address? Um, well, you presented an argument at the beginning. I had a response claiming that it was irrelevant. Um, and then in your responding statements, you didn't bring it up again. So I threw it away. <laughs> <laughs> Looks that way. OK. All right. Uh, what is, is the universe metaphysically contingent? I don't know. Where did the universe come from? I'm not here to solve cosmology. I'm here to debate the existence of God. This is relevant to the existence of God. The, this, I presented this in my... Right, right. So look, there are multiple different cosmological views about where the universe came from. And as far as I know, there's no current scientific consensus about which one of those views is correct. So I don't know how it is that I'm supposed to answer something that the scientific researchers who are currently trying to address that question haven't yet come to a conclusion on. Uh, consensus aside, you don't have to appeal to any consensus. 
Do you think that the universe has always existed? Well, as a non-cosmologist talking about cosmology, I would have to appeal to whatever their consensus is in their scientific field. So, you're going to go with whatever they say? Well, since I'm not a cosmologist, and people who are no more about that field than me are currently addressing that question, um, I mean, the best I can do without actually being a cosmologist myself and actually doing astrophysical research, cosmological research, and doing all that sort of thing is to simply appeal to the consensus. I mean, this, this is, is why a, we this go This is a to philosophical the, issue. The contingency of the universe, uh, it's, it can be supported by scientific data, but the conclusions are drawn by philosophy. And ph philosophy, I assume, is your field. So I'm just asking as to what, what you would consider the modality of the universe. Is it necessary? Is it contingent? And obviously, it's not possible because it's... Look, well, folks, there's a, there's a reason why we go to medical doctors when we're feeling sick and why we don't self-diagnose. It's because we, we think that medical doctors have the kind of expertise necessary in order to make adjudications on medical science. As philosophers, we can then go and interpret the science they're doing, we can give explanations about what it means to be a doctor and so on, but I am not a physical cosmologist, so I'm not going to tell you which theory of physical cosmology is the correct one. What can you approximate? You don't have to tell me which exactly is the correct one, but would you side closer with the contingency of the universe or that the universe is necessary? I can see arguments going either way. So you're, you claim full agnosticism on this point. You don't know. I don't know. Okay. Now, why is it the case that my moral argument is irrelevant to the question of God's existence. So look, you know, we can present an argument for the metaphysical grounding of morality based upon various theistic views, whether that be uh, some kind of general theism or some kind of Christian theism or some other kind of theism. Um, the point of the matter is, is that there are plenty of other metaphysical views that should have an address. The bulk majority of the metaethics literature does not make appeals to God. So unless you want to tell me that that entire bulk of research is wrong, I don't have any problem saying any type of research is wrong. I don't. I'm okay with going against some type of consensus, but to fully dismiss a theistic account of that type of, of metaethics for the ontology of uh, moral commands or imperatives, Dion's logical factors, that type of meta-ethics, God is a very lively and plausible option out there. Deontology is not the only kind of meta-ethics. Yes, there's virtue ethics, there's utilitarian ethics. I'm using deontology as an example. You have notice that all of these theories, none of them actually posit God in any of their versions. Can you give me an example of one that pot that does not posit God? That doesn't posit God? What is your meta-ethical theory? I didn't know that I was here tonight to debate meta-ethics. This is very relevant to my argument, arguing from morality, the objectivity of morality, and that has to have an ontological basis. Yeah, I know that it's, I know that's relevant to your position. And you re are responding to my arguments. That's the relevance here. It's relevant in the sense that that was the argument that you advanced. So you can situate morality within your worldview, but the point is that there are plenty of other ways to situate morality so that one doesn't have to appeal to theism. I understand that, but what is your basis? Do you believe in objective morality? I think it's plausible. You think it's plausible? So, torturing children and then uh, mutilating their bodies and then selling their body parts online in the, or in the black market just for fun, is that right or wrong? 
I would say that's wrong. Is there any possibility that that could be a good thing to do? I don't think so. So you would affirm that it's objectively wrong? Did I just approve? I'm asking you, did you, would you affirm that that scenario is objectively wrong? I mean, even if I did, I mean, suppose we went through this whole thing and, you know, I, I gave you some story about how it is that we can metaphysically ground morality within a secular worldview. You know, suppose that I gave you contractarianism as an example, and then we went through and we talked about the pluses and minuses of contractarianism. Um, all that we would have shown is that there is two competing ways in which to explain objective moral facts. Okay, is, do you agree that they are objectively wrong? I didn't know that's what I was here so nice to debate. This is completely relevant to my argument for morality. And so if you're going to debate me, I would hope that you would interact with my arguments. So I'm just merely asking, do you agree that torturing children for fun is objectively wrong? Sure. It is. What's your, how do you ontologically ground objectivity? How do I ontologically ground objectivity? If it's objective, there has to be an ontological basis for it to be objective. Sure, but, okay. So let's do this game, right? Let's, let's, let's I'll give you contractarianism and you can give me one exchange. Contractarianism. Sure. So some type of, okay. I'm going to switch topics here. Fine tuning. <laughs> How would you respond to the fine tuning argument? How would I respond to the fine tuning argument? How would you respond to it? Well, it's not clear to me. First of all, the universe is fine-tuned. But, so, but, but suppose that I say that it is fine-tuned. It appears to me the universe, if it's fine-tuned, is fine-tuned for a whole lot of empty space. Um, in fact, there's more empty space than there is but space with living creatures in it. But notice if you change the rest mass of the universe, if, if, here's the question. If I were to change the rest mass of the universe, right. all that empty space is required, is necessary for a life from any universe. So all of this empty space is part of a constant, the constant of the rest mass. Well, so look, it's also fine it's also fine-tuned for decaying banana peels. I mean, we think that we're really special, right? And that's why we have this intuition that the fine-tuning is really great, but notice that when we do that, what we're saying is that, for some reason, God produced, if your view was right, God produced his laws of physics, and then had to tweak the parameters into these very fine ranges in order to get the universe that we have. Right? Sure. But then, it seems like God could have created a universe that had, for instance, only the planet Earth, or he could have created a universe uh, that was only fine-tuned. Okay, I don't find you answering this question, so let me get in one real quick question on the ontological. Actually, we don't have time. That's your 10 minutes there, so that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Before we move on, real quick, I just want to check microphones. Uh, is your mic actually working? You might get up a little closer there. Is it actually working there? Max, I want to make sure. And for some reason, I don't like yeah, your microphone's ringing, and I don't know how to control that, so. Um, is yours okay there, Max? Is it working? I, I'll just hold it. Yeah, that, that would be better. Okay, that's fine. So, okay, we go now for uh, uh, 10 more minutes of uh, direct dialogue here. The questions coming from Dan, uh, over to uh, uh, Baxter, and hopefully somebody will look and control our microphone. Thank you, appreciate you doing that for us. Get rid of that ringing sound. Okay? Yeah, go ahead and speak for a second, Dan. Okay. Just go ahead and speak. Dan, uh, to address questions to Max. Okay, so you claim uh, that the fact that there's no research programs that make use of the concept of God, um, that this is a sociological issue. Um, 
And then that seems to me to think, that seems to lead me to think that the other things that you said, they think there's supposed to be some kind of special yeah, medical. Right. I don't think my mic is. All right, okay. Can everyone hear me now? Yeah. All right, good. All right, so, uh, in your statements, it seems like you think that there's some kind of a special metaphysical research method other than scientific methods that we could use to address questions like whether or not there is a God. I was wondering if you could tell me what kind of method that might be. What type of method? I'm sorry, can you rephrase the question? It seems like there was supposed to be some kind of a method other than other than science um, that one would use to infer the existence of a god, um, some kind of special metaphysical method as opposed to a scientific method, because you distinguish between science and metaphysics. I was wondering what kind of research method that might be. Any inquiries concerning God would be a philosophical methodology. God is uh, questions about God are metaphysical questions. And so, uh, and, and with research programs, uh, that, that's incredibly ambiguous, and I'm sure you could uh, fine tune that down to something more specific. For instance, research programs in philosophy can certainly use and. Right, right. So, what I'm God. asking you is what is the method that, if philosophers are the ones who address that question, what sort of methods would you think philosophers should use to address that, that question? Oh, methods, are you talking about an epistemic method? A method that's is right, very that's right. broad here. I'm talking about epistemology. Okay, epistemology. Well, there's several different, I think, valid ways of going about uh, researching God. Uh, I think a scientific theology is a very good epistemic approach. Uh, to understanding God in research, which is using scientific data, and you use that data and then draw inferences from God's relationship to the creation based off of the data. So we can know something about God based off of uh, general relativity. This can be found, with, for instance, with Isaac Newton. Newton uh, often referred to uh, the divine sensorium and ethers and whatnot and, and used God as an explanatory uh, entity, but not as an entity within science alone. Well, I don't think that Newton would have distinguished between the two, in fact. I think that he would have actually have said um, that the whole thing was some kind of natural philosophy or natural theology, would he not? Uh, I, I don't know too much about Newton to be able to comment on that far, as far as where he would draw the line between using God as an entity within science. From what I understand of Newton, I don't think Newton would use God as an entity within science, but it would be a metaphysical inference. Well, in my understanding, in Newton's day, um, there was no distinction between natural philosophy and science. Is that not right? I'm not sure. Um, okay, so here's the picture, that, as I understand it, you've presented, that we have the scientific data, and we're going to explain it using theology. Is that right? I'm sorry. Can you... I'm trying to give your argument back to you. You said that we're going to have the scientific data, and then we're going to use theology, the tools of theology, or something like this, to explain that data. It, it wouldn't explain the data, it would explain aspects about God. So I would not use theology to interpret science. I mean, it, it sounds like that's a fine thing to do if you assume from the get-go that God exists, and then you can ask, what is it that our world, the world that we see around us, tells us about such a thing? Sure, this is, I mean, this is just, scientific theology is just one aspect to it. We can go about different uh, yeah, but what I asked you to begin with is how we could go about inferring what method you think we should use to infer that there is a God. What method should we, well, the best method I think would be abduction since that's the one that primarily uses and employs inferences to the best explanation. So it, we would have 
uh, an abductive or a historical scientific approach to it. That's right. So I. <coughs> So if we have a scientific approach to it, then your earlier comment, which you just said, we'd have a scientific approach to it, then your earlier comment that God as a scientific research program doesn't make sense, well then now that doesn't make sense to me. So I so wonder if you would rec if you, if you could reconcile those two those two claims. Your claim now that we could scientifically infer God, and your claim earlier that we could not scientifically infer God. No, we don't we don't, when we infer to God, that is not a scientific inference. That is a philosophical inference. But you just said that we use an abductive, historical, scientific method by to infer historical to God. historical science, that's the category by which abduction usually functions under. Geology is a historical science. That's right, uh, it's a science. Forensics, yeah. It's a, I'm just, it's a descriptive category I'm using. So, the, so the, what is so? It sounds to me like the, the distinction that you would draw between these two things is that you would say um, the only thing that makes one a scientific question and the other a philosophical question is which academic department someone happens to be in that's asking the question. So, because otherwise, it seems like the same method is being used either way. I'm sorry, I don't understand your question. Well, if we're going to use a, a historical scientific method to infer the existence of God, that sure sounds like science to me. So the only... I think you're confusing what I meant by it's a historical scientific method of abduction, which That's right. Charles Sanders Pierce employed, and the methodology is not science itself. It's purely a methodology applied to historical sciences. And so the methodology itself is not science. I don't know how to draw a distinction between evaluating the world with a scientific method and doing science, because as far as I can tell, those are the same thing. So I would wonder if you could clarify what kind of distinction is still left to be drawn, if not a methodological one. What, what, science, what, what distinction do you want me to make and between what? Between doing science and using a scientific historical method. A methodology is simply methodology, and science uses different types of methodologies. I think there's a, a vast category That's of difference. Right. But, but it seems I can use a hypothetical deductive model or an inductive statistical model for sciences. Those are all methodologies employed by science. But is it not the case that when I'm using one of those many scientific methods, that I'm in fact doing science? Yes, if you're, if you're doing science with any type of methodology, you're still doing science. Okay, then that means that I'm using a historical scientific method. But I can use abduction in a purely philosophical framework without discussing science. And it's still just the methodology. But, but if I'm using abduction to evaluate data, and it's and you, by your own admission, it's a scientific historical method, and using a scientific method, any of these methods, I, I don't understand why that's not doing science. The only thing that I can see is that it just happens to be done by people. There's in a difference department. between doing science and doing methodology. You can do science with different methods. And I can do philosophy with different methods. But if I'm doing philosophy scientifically, it seems to me that I'm still doing science. There is a philosophy of science and philosophy of physics, sure. I mean, they overlap. No, no, but, but those, those are fields that evaluate what it is the scientists are doing, but don't themselves do science. Whereas when you're doing science, that is using a scientific method, one of the many scientific methods, then it seems to me that you're still doing science. So, you think that just because I use abduction in a philosophical argument, I'm doing science? If you're using abduction to evaluate data, to evaluate empirical data, then I think you're doing science. I super disagree with that.
Okay, um, uh, we're going to finish off the debate here with five minutes of closing for each of the participants. We're going to move the podium back so they can come behind the podium and do their closing statement there. So give me a second there. Sean, can you help me? Closing a, a, a discussion here, followed by uh, Dan doing his five minutes of closing discussion here, and then uh, we'll have a time for question and answer. This is a good time, by the way, while they're doing their closing arguments. If you do have questions, to so write them down or write them down. Please pass them to the end of your rows, and we will have some people going up and down the rows collecting these. And if those people can be doing that during this closing time, we can move quickly into the question and answer session. So if you do that for us, we would appreciate that now. Okay, Max. my four arguments for the existence of God. Uh, we have briefly touched on them, if we have touched on them at all. Uh, I will let you know that I'm of a firm position that I'm not throwing any of my arguments out either. And so I'm keeping these arguments. So my first argument was the Thomistic cosmological argument based on contingency. It's an abductive argument that argues for a first transcendent uncaused cause, and that's the best explanation for the contingent constituents of the universe. It's because we observe these contingencies, these contingencies must have other causes. And these contingencies cannot go on into infinity. Okay? And so if they are either themselves uncaused, but if it's contingent, it can't be uncaused, because then that would be a contradiction. Or they can be uh, self-caused, but as we've seen, again, that's a contradiction as well. So given the, con the contingent constituents of the universe, there has to be a first uncaused cause responsible for bringing this into existence. My second argument was the fine-tuning argument. Now, I think what I'm doing here is looking at the scientific pool of data, the cosmological constants, uh, the gravitational constants, the initial conditions of the universe, and we're saying that if we were to change these, uh, the values ever so, then we would live in a universe that is not friendly. It's not anthropically friendly. Life would not be able to exist, let alone maybe a universe to properly function. And so given this evidence, the best explanation for this would be a fine tuner responsible for the parameters that we see and the information when these complex values are compared together and specified in such a way for, the, for, uh, for life to be permitted, this information can only come from a mind that was causally antecedent to it. My third argument, which I'm very adamant about keeping, <laughs> there are objective moral values. Some things are objectively wrong. It is objectively wrong to rape, murder, kill children. This, these things are morally abhorrent. But these, uh, these moral facts have to have an ontological grounding. If we are to say they are objective, they have to be ontologically grounding. And, I've argued that it must be a morally perfect person. A person is the only thing that can issue commands uh, for, uh, for the grounding of the ontology here. 
And lastly, the ontological argument. This was an a priori argument. This argues that if God is even possible, then he must exist. If the first premise is true, the first premise, the property of being magically great is exemplified in some possible world. If that first premise is true, then the rest of the argument follows from modal logic. Thus, if God is possible, if you think that God is remotely possible, then you should believe God actually exists. It's by my intellectual and moral conviction that I am a theist, and it is through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth that I am a Christian theist. And I hope that you will share in my convictions, both intellectually and morally, to follow the evidence presented to you tonight that God does exist. Thank you. All right, how's it going, guys? Good. Good. All righty. So, uh, again, going from the back and forwards and sort of moving around throughout the whole thing. Um, so the first thing is that he says that one of his arguments, his ontological arguments, follows from modal logic. Uh, but actually, there are multiple different versions of modal logic. So there are modal logics, uh, which are pretty technical, but there's something called the Axiom S5, um, which I'm not going to get into right now. You can like, ask me what that is if you would like to. But it's the axiom that's really, 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 really important for doing moves like the one that Max wants to do in his ontological argument. Um, but in fact, it's not non-controversial. It's pretty controversial as to whether or not S5 is even something that can be used or appealed to, or whether or not that particular form of modal logic is legitimate. Remember, I had my two general inferential rules that I provided at the beginning. We favor a hypothesis of the evidence that we would expect to have if the hypothesis were true, and with evidence against the hypothesis if the evidence is contrary to what we have, if the hypothesis is true, it's really just a non technical version of doing the kinds of things that Max wants to do with this inference the best explanation, with abductive argumentation. So, really, we're both making abductive arguments if you want to you know the argument form. But my abductive argument is to God probably not existing, and Max's abductive argument is to God probably existing. So at best, even if his arguments still stand, I'm not convinced that they do, uh, we really just have a standoff. But like we said at the beginning, we all agree that nature exists. And so if there is a standoff, then the best that we have is naturalism. We have the position that we know that there is nature, but we don't know if there's anything more than that. There are several of the questions that raised at the beginning that I haven't heard addressed. For example, why should we think that the mysterious phenomenon question is to a single being, as opposed to multiple beings or mechanisms? And if, since we don't have that, the answer to that question, it should be considered evidence against the theistic hypothesis. But why should we think that all these phenomena are created by the same thing and at the same time, as opposed to creation of multiple things and on multiple times? Well, that's, again, it's evidence against God. Uh, how do we know that the fine-tuning wasn't due to some physical mechanism that is not yet understood. Again, evidence against God. If we can't answer that question because the conservative answer is just that it's due to some feature of nature. Uh, Max really never addressed one of the big arguments that I gave, which is that there seems to be something that's metaphysically and conceptually problematic about, the, about positing the existence of God um, remember, I wrote this thing about a non-spatial mountain. Right? Can any of you imagine what a non-spatial mountain would be like? A mountain that didn't exist in space? It seems like it's intrinsic to being a mountain that it exists in space. Similarly, it seems intrinsic to being a person, having a will, and causing events that you exist in time. Right? I mean, how could it be a personal God 
is the God that you pray to is not the kind of thing that actually can respond when you pray. It seems like such a being would have to exist in time. But Max wants to tell you that such a being does not exist in time. That it's outside of time. And we really haven't had an adequate response to the kind of problem of evil that I raised. Now, it's called a problem of evil, but really that's a misnomer. Um, really, it's not about whether there's evil in the world, it's about whether there's suffering in the world. And furthermore, it's supposed to be reductio of theism. It's supposed to get inside of theism and show that if you assume that theism is true, the kind of world that we see would be really, really surprising. But in the theistic view, Everyone agrees that there's morality. Max agrees that you can ground morality in a theistic view. So it's not surprising that you can ground morality there and have an explanation for evil. But again, it's a reductio. It's supposed to show that the world as we have it is really, really surprising. So the theist is the one who needs to tell us why, on his view, there's so much evil in the world. I don't have to tell you why there's so much evil in the world. I can certainly explain to you why there's so much suffering, so much capricious <laughs> suffering out there. That fits with my worldview. Time. All right. <laughs> okay, uh, very good. Well, I appreciate the, uh, uh, the um, uh, both of our participants here have done an excellent job. We have, do you have some questions uh, from the come from the audience? I mean, we're going to take about 20 minutes to do this. That's all we have to do. We're going to put time into that. Uh, to get you out of here. Um, uh, those of you who are going to stay here. Uh, anyway, and we'll, uh, we'll do these questions in the order in which we've been doing the uh, presentations. We'll start with Max, then we'll move to Dan, and we'll kind of go back and forth until uh, basically our time has run out here. So we'll start with Max here. Question for Max here is Max, how is the problem of evil a proof for God? How is the. Uh, how is the problem of evil a proof for God? Uh, I, I would, didn't formalize that in the argument, but I, I'd say it's an indirect proof for, for God. The basis or the essence of the moral argument is that we have to ground objective moral facts in God. And so if we can objectively claim that something is good, then God must exist because we're grounding the ontology of that, the objectivity in God. If we can, in turn, make the pronouncement that something is objectively evil, we can then say that because we can inversely uh, say that evil is objective and that it is the absence, that evil is the absence of this good, we can't make any objective judgments on that without God. So if there is no God, then all things are permitted, and we can't make any moral pronouncements. Okay. Dan, you want to make a, a comment? Or a response to that? Uh, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so as I said before, um, the argument should really be called the argument of suffering, because what it's about is the amount of capricious, random, seemingly senseless, suffering in the world, um, but it can also be seen as a reductio argument, as I already stated. What that means is you get up inside of theism, you assume that theism is true, and then show that a problem follows. The problem that follows is that if theism is true, you wouldn't expect to see the kind of world that we have. So on Max's view, everyone agrees that there's some way that he thinks he can ground objective moral truths. That's fine. Well, then he has to explain to us why it is that there's so much evil in the world, since he thinks that there's so much evil in the world. Thank you. Okay, a question for Dan. Dan, do you believe that meta-ethical views that are secular are intrinsic, or that they evolve from deductive, inductive arguments? I have no idea what that question means. On the one hand, we we might think that we might think that we can arrive at a meta-ethical view through argumentation. That's probably, probably the only way to arrive at a meta-ethical view, or to convince someone of its truth. 
At the same time, it's not the argument that gives the meta-ethical position whatever means to be metaphysically grounded. Um, it's not what it gives it reality. So I, I just I don't I just don't understand what that's supposed to be asking me. Okay. Uh, you are you want to respond to that? <laughs> Max. The universe is fine too. Question mark. Your uh, your only evidence is that the Earth is or seems to be. How is that relevant to a universal God? Especially since the rest of the universe is hostile to us. So my only evidence. Can't, I'm sorry, can you repeat that one more time? Sure, no problem. This is the universe is fine tuned as a question. Your only evidence is that the Earth is or seems to be. How is that relevant to a universal God, especially since the rest of the universe is hostile to us? Well, I think the, the rest of the universe is most likely very hostile to life. So, yes, we do live in this cosmic speck, this pale blue dot of Earth. But without the rest of space out there, which happens to be hostile to us, we would still would be able to exist. Those are part of the fine-tuning parameters. The, the minimal mass in the universe, the total mass of the universe, Planck's constants for energy, uh, all of these are essential for environments for life to come about. And so when we say, oh, there's a lot of dead stars, there's a lot of dead stuff out in space, that's certainly true, but those are byproducts of fine-tuning. And without them, we would not exist. Can I respond to that? Sure. All right, so I think this, one of the things that sometimes happens in these arguments is that and this might be a problem with philosophy in general, is that people's imaginations are not as broad as they possibly could be. What Max posits is a being who is all-powerful, who can do absolutely anything, right? Any logically, or sometimes we'll say metaphysically possible task is a task that God can do. And it's certainly possible that God could have, if God existed, then he could have created a world that was only the Earth. I don't see a reason why God would have to be constrained to creating all of that stuff. That seems to be a failure of the imagination to me. All right, the next question is for quote unquote Virginia Tech guy. <laughs> I mean, come on, guys, his name is Dan. Is it that hard to remember? I don't want to say it all night, but all right. Anyway, Dan, okay. in case. If we live in a determined world, and ought implies can, how can you as a naturalist affirm the existence of moral obligations? Uh, a determined world? Uh, well, first of all, quantum mechanics tells us, or many interpretations of quantum mechanics, and the orthodox interpretations of quantum mechanics tell us the world is indeterministic. So it's not determined. Um, Maybe what you mean is an objective world. It's the world has objective properties in it. Um, what was the letter after the question said, if the world is determined, then? Uh, how can you, as a naturalist, affirm the existence of moral obligations? Right, well, I, I mean, again, I, I just, I'm not here to debate meta-ethics tonight. I'm not a meta-ethicist. Um, you know, I leave that up to my meta-ethics colleagues to do research on meta-ethics. Um, there are views more attracted to than others, but I, I just, that's not, I just understand the relevance. All right, and would you like to respond? Yes. Um, any appeal to quantum mechanics on, on this level would be inappropriate because it would, supposedly, if quantum mechanics is purely indeterministic, there are other models out there that take the Schrodinger equation to be deterministic, such as de Broglie Bohm. Uh, the Bohmian approach, or the many worlds interpretation approach, are deterministic for Schrodinger. And also, by this indeterminism, one, you've got to have causally antecedent parameters in order for these situations to occur, or these uh, supposed quantum indeterminism 
or quantum indeterminism to take place. But besides that, you're equivocating randomness of indeterminism with some type of a faculty of free will. And so you can't equivocate the randomness of an indeterministic outcome in quantum mechanics, even if that's the case, to some type of freedom. Thank you. Okay, Max, if the constants of nature were different, perhaps other forms of life would have existed. Would, their fine, would the fine-tuning argument be flawed, assuring they made the same argument that you have? Let me read that again. Yes, yes. Sure yes. I'm not sure. If the constants of human nature were different, perhaps other forms of life would have existed. Would their fine-tuning argument, these other forms of life, be flawed, assure, assuming they made the same argument that you have? Um, I think I would just have to appeal to I don't know. There's so many parameters in that question that ha would have to be defined. Uh, I, I think a minimal case for life as we know it is a, is a carbon-based life. And I think it's what, silicon is the next highest, is in second place, and even NASA working on arsenic life, but those are way far behind. But if we change the constants, let alone change, if we change the values, then no, I don't think we're gonna have any life. But if we say, well, we're not just gonna change the value of gravity, but gravity doesn't exist in something else, if we have completely different physics, then it could be anything. The, you would have to, uh, that's a completely different system. We couldn't know. Okay, you want to respond? Sure. Okay. Uh, well, earlier in your comments, you said that uh, apparently there was one of the parameters you mentioned, uh, if you tune it in such and such a way, uh, all you would have would be a universe of hydrogen. Um, now people like Fred Coyle and some others have speculated that you could have giant living clouds of gas, so I don't know why you couldn't have life in a universe like that. But again, um, I don't know why it is that just because our laws of physics, as we presently understand them, and we certainly don't have the end story to the whole thing, right? we, don't have the, we don't have the final theory that scientists will eventually have, if science ever had the final theory, and without knowing that, we don't know the degree to which these parameters are actually finely tuned, how they relate to each other, or if they might be all determined by a single constant. Okay, our next question is for Dan. Dan, you mentioned that the problem of evil is a main argument against the existence of God. Working from the premise that God does not exist, how do you evaluate the concept of evil that is used in the argument against God? All right, so it's, it's like this. So if you try to explain a given phenomenon with a given explanation, there are going to be features of that explanation that, you, that are going to tell you things that you would expect to be in the world. So if you posit that theism is true, there are certain things that you would expect to be true as a result of that. That's the way that you abductively infer whether or not God exists based upon the things that we observe. And that's actually the game that me and Max are both engaged in tonight. And what I tried to provide you with was a reason to think that the kinds of things that theism would predict us to see in the universe are not the things that we in fact see. And that's, that's a reason to think that theism is not the best explanation for the observed data. We will have one final question for each of the participants. I'll start with Max here. Max, is conduct morally right because God commands it, or does God command it because it is right? <laughs> Where have we heard this before? <laughs> if the former couldn't, couldn't, if the former, couldn't God have commanded us to torture children? If the latter, how does God help understand objective morality? Oh, uh, the youth approach dilemma. <laughs> uh, the youth approach dilemma is a false dilemma. Uh, there's, there's more options. There's one more option to consider. Obviously, well, let me first knock out why the first two options are incorrect. The reason, or 
the option? What's the first option there? <laughs> the first option is, is God morally right because God, is morality right because God commands it? Yeah, so if morality is right because God commands it, that just makes morality arbitrary because God could command uh, standing on our heads could be the height of moral perfection or something that we could perceive as right now morally bad, uh, that could then be morally right. So it becomes arbitrary. But if God commands something because it's good, then there happens to be something that's good outside of God. And so why isn't that good God? And so the reason why this is a false dilemma is because the third option is that God God's commands, or God commands something because He is good. And so when God commands, He's not referring to anything beyond Himself, nor are they arbitrary. The goodness is within God, and so God's commands are, or God's commands are good because He is good. All right, so the idea is that God's commands are good because God is good. Well, it seems to be the case that we're still talking about commands, and it seems to me that the youth of law still stands. But supposing that we take this seriously for a moment that God's commands are the things that we should do because God himself has this intrinsic property of being good. Well, that doesn't explain how it is that God has that property, um, unless we want to simply assert that God's prop that God's property of being good is one of these maximally great properties, or something like that. One of these great making properties that God is asserted to have necessarily. But again, that was all just assertion. Um, it seems to me that this is actually the old trick of the dragon in the garage. It's ad hoc to simply assert that God has this property. Our final question is to Dan. Based on the assumption that there is no God, how do you explain the complexity of human consciousness? Well, at some level, this, uh, this question is a really simple answer. And um, actually, ironically, there's another sense which has a really complex answer. Uh, but I'm first going to say that whether God exists or not um, doesn't necessarily tell us whether or not you could have complex things. Right? So in naturalism, on naturalism, you can certainly have certainly have complex things. But the simple answer is that the reason why consciousness is complex um, is because our brain is complex. That would be the naturalistic answer. Um, a more sophisticated answer is that there are physical processes which are capable, on the naturalistic view, of bringing about complex systems, like the, like the brain. Um, a, one such process would be the process of evolution. Um, now we're not we're not here tonight to debate the process of evolution. In fact, on Max's blog, he several times says that one should distinguish between these two questions of the inference to the existence of God versus the question of whether or not evolution actually exists in the world. But under our naturalistic worldview, evolution is the current scientific consensus of how it is that complex systems like living things and brains and so on came about. And Max, a final response if you want to? Could you repeat the question? Sure. The question concerns, um, based on the assumption that there is no God, how do you explain the complexity of human consciousness? Um, I think consciousness itself uh, is hard enough to explain in great detail. So whether or not com complexity, I don't think, is a mere issue that would go against a naturalistic perspective. Um, and so, 
uh, in defense of, for Dan there, complexity doesn't really accomplish much against his position. Uh, it would have to be specified in the, some way that would have to account for that. But consciousness alone, um, I, I think he's going to have a hard time explaining consciousness, whatever his theory will be. Um, but that, that will just be open. I think that's going to be something that uh, whatever theory he does propose, it will be insufficient to account for, for consciousness. Okay, thank you very much. That basically concludes our debate, folks. I want to thank our participants. Please give them a hand. thank our audience for your uh, uh, your quiet, your attentiveness. We really do appreciate that being here. I have two quick announcements here before you leave. Our Ratio Christi organization here does offer a number of opportunities for you to learn a little bit more about arguing for God's existence and these kinds of things. On April 11th, we have our next training session, our on-guard training session, where we discuss the moral argument for God's existence, one of the issues that was certainly raised here. On April 16th, we will have our next major event. Dr. Ed Martin, who's one of the co-chairs of our philosophy department, is going to discuss the problem of hell. How do we address that issue? Okay? I want to invite you back for those. I want to thank you very much tonight. Have a very, very good night.